Hello and a very warm welcome to everyone who has joined our webinar today, which we are holding in partnership with the Federation of Indian Chambers of Commerce and Industry, more commonly referred to as FICI. The UK is due to leave the European Union on 31st December, which will affect every business trading with Europe in any way, as well as the UK's global outlook. Before we go any further, we're just going to ask our audience whether they think there will be a deal on 31st December. So the question should appear on your screen and we will share the results shortly. To give just a few examples, trade deals have already been signed with Switzerland and Japan, in addition to agreements in principle with Canada and Kenya. There are also further deals in negotiation, including with Mexico, Singapore and Turkey. The recent ministerial meeting on 9th November between the UK and India was productive, and we expect some clarity in the coming weeks on the enhanced trade partnership, which is the first step on a journey to a free trade agreement. To help us look at the opportunities and indeed the challenges that Brexit offers, I am delighted to welcome our panel of experts. We have with us today Mr. Dilip Chinoy, Secretary General at FICI, Richard Cranfield, a partner at Allen & Overy, as well as Global Chairman of the Corporate Practice and co-head of their Financial Institutions Group, and Shanella Rajanayagam, who is a trade economist at HSBC. As we look at what the UK India Trade and Investment Partnership will look like post-Brexit, we will delve into more detail on the opportunities this will open for enhanced trade between both countries, the legal and regulatory challenges which may arise and therefore what steps businesses should be taking now, and finally the economic opportunities and challenges which will come out of this, including looking at the current trade deals in place and those which are upcoming. As ever, before we begin the session, I'd like to remind our viewers they have automatically been placed on mute. If you have any comments or questions, please do type these into your control panel and we will pick these up later in the discussion. We will also have a recording available for our participants to refer to at a later date. Now, before I introduce our first speaker, we're about to close our poll, so please do answer if you haven't already done so. Thank you very much, and I would now like to introduce our first speaker, Mr. Dilip Chinoy. Dilip is Secretary General of FICI and leads the Permanent Secretariat of the Chamber, which is the largest and oldest apex business organization in India. Prior to this, Dilip served as MD and CEO of the National Skill Development Corporation. Over to you, Mr. Chinoy. Uh, thank you uh, for that uh, uh, introduction. Uh, good morning, I presume, to everybody in the UK and uh, good afternoon uh, to uh, the audience uh, in India. Uh, first of all, uh, it's a pleasure to be uh, with all of you at this uh, UK IBC and PICI UK India Relations Post Brexit uh, webinar. Uh, and it's great, uh, you know, uh, to be uh, with. Uh, Richard uh, uh, and also uh, with uh, Shanella, uh, who are uh, you know who are going to be making uh, their presentations, and also you know with Chris and the other uh, colleagues uh, from the UK India uh, Business Council, and I hope uh, Param, our colleague in UK, is also uh, at this. So you now, for interestingly, your poll question, you know, uh, is a very interesting uh, question. Uh, irrespective of what actually happens in that outcome, I think the UK and India relationship uh, um, has a, a different uh, dimension uh, to it uh, going forward. Of course, a lot of people, uh, you know, uh, say that the Brexit uh, it does pose a few challenges both to EU and to the UK's economy. Uh, but I believe, and a lot of people in India believe that it may be opportunities for uh, developing bilateral relations uh, and increasing trade and investment engagements, let's say between the UK and India. On a lighter note, uh, sometimes earlier when I was in conversation with some other countries uh, in EU, uh, you know, very one interesting observation is while we may uh, we may like this idea and we may agree, agree, but we don't know whether it fits into the EU framework and whether we'd be allowed uh, to actually look at it uh, going forward. So sometimes, you know, it, it may be uh, a possibility that we could uh, negotiate and work together bilateral trade uh, uh, agreements uh, between UK and India. And of course, UK itself will have a huge interest in deepening its own uh, interaction and engagement with the uh, world. And I believe that there are a few sectors which would be of interest to both sides, uh, you know, uh, agro and agro uh, products, uh, you know, um, I think uh, 
both sides have an interest uh, in that. Um, okay, while UK is a net importer, uh, India is an, also an exporter in some segments. It'll be interesting because there are some non-tariff barriers and some challenges there, and I'm sure we can find, uh, uh, you know, to work around uh, that. And then, you know, if we have a kind of a bilateral discussion, then there might be areas where you would uh, lower tariffs and where India uh, could uh, lower tariffs, uh, in, uh, you know, for uh, products from uh, UK. The second uh, area, which I think is a real opportunity, but there is also a fear, is the services uh, kind of sector, where uh, you know uh, UK, uh, you know, in the financial services is greatly ahead, but in some case, some ends where the BPO or the KPO uh, area uh, is, there could be bilateral uh, kind of opportunities there, even if you look at the. Uh, uh, newly emerging things like uh, machine learning or artificial intelligence and augmented reality and virtual uh, reality. India has been investing uh, in the UK, um, right? Primarily, a lot of people actually thought because it is a gateway uh, to Europe, uh, how uh, we actually uh, you know, keep that uh, opportunity alive and what we do from both sides uh, would uh, to a large extent uh, relate to uh, the investment uh, scenario. Of course, there are many uh, challenges and I talked about the services area. People thought that in the service area uh, where uh, once, uh, you know, being in Europe, being in UK, it was like cross-border movement was not an issue. How this will uh, actually, uh, you know, come about. And then how will we look at figuring out the rules of origin, the whole customs uh, thing and the other uh, compliances uh, going forward. Uh, colleagues and others you know, have identified some areas uh, where they were to face the heat, but uh, uh, we don't know whether it will actually be there or turn into an opportunity. You know, auto components, the Jaguar, Land Rover, Tata relationship, uh, a lot of others um, in that region, many Indian companies actually uh, do the aftermarket there. We've talked about uh, the IT, uh, you know, an IT enabled services earlier, so I won't repeat that point. So, you know, if I were to really uh, uh, look at it uh, uh, across two other sectors very quickly, one is metals, uh, right? And, you know, the steel industry is a big uh, sector. Um, and how we address that, uh, you know, there's a there's a steel plant in 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 France, for example, which provides a lot of employment for people in in England uh, because of some process that they use. Uh, but how do we uh, look at uh, you know the access into EU and impacts on companies? And of course, the garment and uh, sector, will there be an opportunity? And you know, how do we do that? Because um, the Indian garment industry was looking at a PTA with the EU, but will it be possible with the UK going forward? It'll be another idea. So I think it is a very interesting time we are there, uh, and it's all made all the more interesting and more all the more challenging with the COVID uh, challenge. But there are areas of opportunity. Uh, there are areas if we proactively work together and bring people uh, along the same viewpoint, we can dramatically increase bilateral trade and investment uh, and economic engagement going forward. Uh, there is also the whole area of the media and entertainment sector, which we can look at uh, very differently, or the gaming sector, we can look differently. So once again, uh, thank you. And I've just taken a minute and a half more than my time. Apologies for that. But I'll hand it over uh, uh, to the moderator for their taking this on. So thank you and look forward to listening to the other presentations. Thank you, Mr. Choi, for setting the scene for us there. Um, before I hand over to our next speaker, let's just take a quick look at how the audience answered our first poll. So there we have it, very close. Um, so thank you everyone for participating in that question, and we will have another poll later on in the session. Um, and at this point, just a reminder, if you have any questions, do pop them into your control panel and we will pick those up. And I will now like to invite Richard Cranfield to share his insights with us. As a brief introduction, Richard has over 30 years of experience in mergers and acquisitions and in capital markets, both international and domestic for equity financings. His corporate clients include 
FTSE 100 and FTSE 250 companies in the UK and large public and private corporations outside of the UK. So Richard, if I can please hand over to you. Thank you very much. And um, so my few slides are entitled Brexit, where does it stand? And I think the short answer to that is we really don't know. Uh, Michel Barnier and David Frost may know what's going on, but I think the rest of us don't. Uh, and that, of course, is uh, very tricky for business because what business needs is certainty and the ability to plan. But putting that aside, let's just go into the slideshow. If we go to the first slide. Um, so the beginning of Brexit essentially was, um, well, the, 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 the immediate beginning of Brexit was the referendum back in 2016. Uh, and this slide tries to set out you know what the key milestones are uh, I think the reality is that there are no key milestones basically uh, this is a story of milestones missed left right and center uh, you know the 26th of November this year was meant to be the original final date for agreement of a free traders agreement of course that's gone and gone away and the 1st of January is the end of the implementation period the transition period um, and there may well be an agreement. Uh, it may well be agreed this week or next week. Uh, whether or not it will be formally ratified by the 31st of December depends on both the UK Parliament and their processes, and also the EU Council and the EU the European Parliament and their processes. And so uh, who actually knows? But what we do know, I think, is that uh, discussions, negotiations, all the rest of it will continue uh, next year because not everything's going to get settled. If we could go to the next slide. So just to think a bit about the politics behind this. Um, uh, back in 2016, uh, I, I remember talking both externally and internally and saying this Brexit is, is like the sort of the biggest demerger in history uh, because my background is being a, a corporate uh, a mergers and acquisitions uh, lawyer. So I saw, saw it as a demerger. Yet, yet this has not turned out into a demerger. This has turned out into a divorce. And I would say this turned out into actually a bitter divorce with all the things which we associate with that. Um, I think what we've learned is that there's a very different political approach. Uh, the, the EU has taken a very economically driven approach. And so they're very interested in uh, doing a transaction, doing a, a deal, uh, with the UK, which uh, derives economic benefits for them. Um, the, the UK side, frankly, um, shows a, a short-term lack of interest in economic consequences. Uh, there was a famous quote from Boris Johnson a couple of years back where he was quite rude about business and he used the, the F word. Um, but that, that actually is, um, there's an interest in the long-term economic consequences, but not, I think, in what's going to happen in 2021 or 2022. Um, behind the, the whole thing on the EU side, there is definitely, uh, in the COVID crisis, there's been a, a split between the way that has uh, happened in, the, in Northern Europe against Southern Europe. Uh, there are real issues, I think, uh, internally for the EU around foreign policy, around immigration, about economic focus, you know, the question about Italy's debt. Uh, and there's also the, the, the tension between Germany and France as to uh, how, how it's run. On, on the UK side, they are equally profound issues. Um, Scottish independence is back on the agenda. Uh, Irish unification is, is definitely out there. Um, there's, a, there's quite a large view that the UK government has struggled to, to deal with COVID. Uh, and I use the word shambles. I think that's a that's my word. But if you know, can the government afford a Brexit shambles after a COVID shambles? And of course, with a new US president, uh, the, the 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 transatlantic relations have changed. So going into the detail, if we could go on to the next slide. So so what we do know is that there is a new immigration system, and so moving people around between the UK and the EU, but also the the UK and the rest of the world, the UK immigration systems had to be reworked. Um, and so basically, this slide sets out the, the very high level, the new rules for people moving into the UK, and that also encompasses uh, from India. Um, 
the, the only place where there remains freedom of movement is between the UK and the Republic of Ireland. Uh, for the rest of the EU26, uh, if you want to uh, move from the UK or from anywhere else into the EU26, there's a separate national regime. But so, you know, there is a new immigration system. If we go to the, the next slide. So what will the free trade agreement, if it's agreed, what will it what will it cover? What will it do? Well, uh, we, you know, we, we, we sort of know some of the outlines. Um, uh, we're told it's uh, the current draft, the legal text is 1800 pages long. So I was quite relieved that it wasn't agreed last night and people were going to ask questions to me this morning about what it says, because uh, I wouldn't know. Um, but fundamentally, um, the free trade agreement means that you don't have to trade on, on uh, WTO terms. Uh, and WTO terms <coughs> are perfectly well known and understood, but you just get a, a better and enhanced and smoother relationship. Uh, hopefully, that would include tariff-free trade between the UK and the EU27, uh, and hopefully it would also deal with the question which was mentioned earlier about rules of origin, because rules of origin are another complexity which mean that um, manufacturers in particular uh, have to struggle with. Uh, the, there is a new customs regime coming in, come up with it, whether or not there's a free trade agreement, but uh, it will be it should be easier uh, if there's a free trade agreement. Although I have to say, uh, my expectation is um, things in January uh, 2021 will be quite quite difficult and possibly shambolic on the the, the borders between the UK and, and the EU27. Um, and you know, I think the working assumption for everyone should be um, it's going to be difficult to move stuff physically. Uh, across those borders and so I, I would say to people uh, you know stockpiling and being prepared for for delays uh, sh should be should be good planning um, th th there will be provisions I, I assume in the free trade agreement about services um, the, the, the GATS regime is is pretty uh, um, slim and so basically the, the, the service industry, which obviously is a huge part of the UK economy, um, is, is basically uh, potentially quite vulnerable to, to a lack of agreement. Uh, although my feeling is that most service industries who we interact with ha have made their, their, their preparations and are ready, you know, certainly Alan Nova is ready, but I think, you know, are ready to trade uh, on the basis of there's no deal. A uh, free trade agreement will also have some specialist chapters uh, and, you know, we hear in the press in the UK and I think elsewhere that the contentious issues are around uh, the level playing field um, and the sort of jurisdictional regime to resolve uh, breaches of the agreement and, of course, the question of fish. And on timing, as I said earlier, I mean, who knows? Um, Every every deadline's been missed, and so I can see this slipping into the middle of December, and then being a mad scramble. And it's quite possible that a free trade agreement was agreed in December, and it's not ratified by the 31st of December, but it will actually just be informally implemented. If you just go to the next slide, financial services obviously for the UK are are a very very big deal, and it, it's clear, frankly, that um, um, free trade agreement or not, uh, the financial services regime is 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 going to be materially impacted. So um, the the there will be no agreement uh, conferring automatic market access, and so the the existing passporting rights which have been granted to financial services companies to trade across the EU uh, will go, and the passporting rights relating to products uh, across the EU will go. And um, th there's a possibility uh, for rulings of equivalence, um, and, and the issue of equivalence is, is talked about. But the, the truth is that uh, equivalence is something which is uh, granted by either the EU27 or the UK, uh, and it can be taken away. And so no financial services businesses have actually made um, uh, plans based around equivalence because they're just not reliable. Um, the UK has provided 
uh, equivalence rulings about two weeks ago on in 17 areas, 17 out of 50, as it happens. And so that that is helpful. The EU, EU is is not doing that because it's I think all wrapped up in the negotiations of the free trade agreement. If there's going to be one, uh, and the UK has also basically announced that uh, they will create a, a temporary permission regime which starts on the 1st of January, recognising, frankly, that it's not going to be possible to get all the plumbing of the financial services markets and financial markets fixed by the 1st of January, which is just recognising uh, the obvious. Um, and on the next slide, um, just dealing with equivalence, I mean, the, the equivalence is a concept whereby uh, the EU recognises someone else's regime as being equivalent to the EU regime and therefore the basis on which uh, an open set of exemptions can be granted. And, and you know, there are equivalence rulings, uh, for example, in the European free trade zone. So um, Norway and Switzerland have those. Um, and, and of course, they, they have announced that uh, the political declaration announced that um, this was all going to be done by June 2020. And of course, actually, it hasn't. And now that's just, I think, a, another example about how what should be an administrative issue has just become a political one. Uh, and my final slide, if you could put that up. Um, so English law is is sort of uh, widely used in a lot of contracts, uh, not just in, in the UK. Um, and so the, there was some speculation about whether Brexit would actually affect the use of English law. And I think that uh, what we've seen over the last three or so years is actually it, it's pretty much business as usual. That There are some sort of technical issues around how a jurisdiction needs to be uh, created and, and put in contracts. But I think that we see uh, English law just carrying on as being one of the essentially two systems of law, which is used for a lot of international trading. Uh, the one, the other one, basically being U.S. law or New York law. So I've uh, taken up my ten minutes, and I will now uh, hand over to to um, Fenella. Thanks so much, Richard, for that really detailed overview. That was really helpful. Um, so yes, so we'll now hand over to Shanella for her presentation. Um, and again, just as some brief background, Shanella joined HSBC from the UK Treasury, where she worked on a range of trade policy issues related to Brexit. Prior to that, she also worked as an economist at the New Zealand Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Trade. So, Shanella, looking forward to your presentation. Over to you. Great. Thanks very much, Dexa. And maybe if we just skip ahead to the next slide. So, about 10 months ago, we in the trade team at HSBC, we set out our central case for the outcome of UK-EU trade negotiations. And that was that both sides would agree a partial trade deal. Uh, now, given the, the time is running out and given the key sticking points that Richard mentioned, that still very much remains our central case, um, bearing in mind that this could comprise a spectrum of options. So it could range from a goods-only trade deal to something that has tariff-free, quota-free access for goods uh, to something a bit more comprehensive that includes uh, standalone arrangements of services, investment, regulatory cooperation, and so on. Um, but the key point here is that even if a partial trade deal is agreed, there will still be new trade barriers between the UK and the EU. So additional border frictions for businesses trading on either side. And as we see in the next slide, um, which shows the UK government's own economic modelling for the outcome of various uh, Brexit uh, scenarios, we see that even under an FTA type scenario, uh, this could result in a hit to UK GDP of around 5% in the long term. Um, and that's basically because of these additional non-tariff barriers that may crop up even if tariff-free trade is agreed between the two parties. Uh, now, non-tariff barriers can affect not only goods trade, but also services trade as well, uh, particularly if we don't get those equivalence arrangements in place. Uh, and I'll also just like to note here that our UK economist 
uh, they actually expect UK GDP to be around 6% lower at the end of 2022 uh, compared to their pre-pandemic forecasts, uh, which actually assumed a more comprehensive deal with the EU. So given that time is quickly running out, uh, we do see this weighing on economic growth prospects for the UK uh, economy. And if we just skip to the next slide. So in the meantime, the UK continues to advance its own trade preparations. So it's announced its uh, new tariff schedule that will take effect. It's announced some facilitations uh, on the customs front uh, to phase in those customs declaration requirements and also to uh, also defer payments for up to six months next year. Uh, but also another kind of plus is that the UK can now press ahead with striking free trade deals uh, with with new partners, uh, but also it needs to roll over existing trade deals uh, that it's already party to, or it was party to as a member of the EU. So it's kind of a two-track process with FTAs at the moment. Uh, just going to the next slide, on the trade continuity deal, so these are the deals that the UK is trying to replicate, uh, the existing EU FTAs, it's already rolled over about 24 of these. It has another 16 left to go. Uh, we saw recently it signed the trade continuity deal with Japan. Uh, it's concluded the deal with Canada. It's also got Switzerland in the bag. Uh, however, a key point to note is that some aspects of these uh, particular trade deals uh, still require the finalization of a UK EU trade deal to be uh, completed. So for example, uh, there are annexes in the Swiss, the Swiss agreement around agricultural standards uh, that require either harmonization with EU law or equivalence with EU law to be agreed uh, before it can actually be decided upon. And also similarly, uh, a key sticking point is rules of origin. So the UK has basically agreed accumulation of rules of origin with its uh, FTA partners, uh, which essentially means that UK businesses can use inputs from the EU uh, in its production and in its exports to these FTA partners and still qualify for uh, tariff preferences. However, because the EU has not agreed rules of origin accumulation with the UK, there's still kind of a missing link, uh, which means that UK exporters of intermediate inputs could uh, lose out uh, if that accumulation is not agreed going forward. Uh, and also there are agreements, uh, for example, with Turkey, which is in a customs union with the EU, uh, which cannot be finalized until that UK-EU deal is actually completed. And just skipping to the next slide. Um, so this is uh, this shows the economic impact of the UK-Japan trade deal that was recently signed. Now there was a lot of kind of fanfare about this deal, uh, but it's not a fundamentally new deal. Uh, the bulk of tariff liberalisation remains the same under this deal. The key benefit, of course, is that it uh, continues to provide those trade preferences to businesses on both sides. Um, but as I mentioned, tariff liberalisation basically the same. Uh, including for autos. Uh, the UK has agreed to lower tariffs on some car parts uh, from Japan a bit quicker than under the existing EU trade agreement. Uh, there's also some facilitations for UK malt exporters to Japan, uh, so they'll um, face less customs uh, declaration requirements uh, because they'll be able to use a different quota than under the EU Japan EPA. Uh, there's also some uh, benefits around rules of origin, so additional flexibilities that have been agreed, uh, for example, in some agricultural products, so UK and Japanese businesses will be able to use inputs from other economies in order to qualify for tariff preferences, uh, and also for textiles, which is a relatively big win because the EU-Japan EPA was a bit restrictive on that front, so UK businesses, for example, will be able to just conduct one uh, manufacturing process in the UK, for example, sewing, uh, provided around half of the inputs are sourced domestically. Um, there's also uh, an agreement to cooperate on financial services. Uh, crucially, uh, there's been a ban on data localization for financial services agreed under this deal, which is quite, which goes beyond the existing EU-Japan agreement. Um, and also it's codified the mutual recognition agreements on a number of industrial products 
uh, for example, electrical products or telecoms equipment, which will kind of reduce some of the need for additional or duplicative testing when exporting to each economy. Uh, so these deals, they are important in preserving trade preferences, uh, but they aren't fundamentally new agreements. Um, and if we just skip to the next slide. So in addition to preserving these uh, preferences, the benefit of trade deals is, of course, that it provides market diversification opportunities. And this is something that we've been stressing, particularly in the wake of COVID, uh, where a number of economies and businesses are looking to reduce their reliance on single foreign suppliers. Uh, it really does expand trade opportunities. Now, of course, the EU comprises the bulk of UK trade flows, uh, but striking these additional trade deals can provide expansion opportunities, particularly into new regions. Uh, and especially if the UK is looking to expand into the Asia Pacific, this is a great way to do so. Um, now, in addition to rolling over the trade uh, continuity deals, the UK is also looking to strike new FTAs with the US, with Australia and New Zealand. Uh, it's also looking to accede to the CPTPP, so the Comprehensive and Progressive Agreement for trans pacific Partnership. It is a bit of a mouthful, uh, but that agreement is a really high standards trade deal. Uh, and, you know, Japan, Canada, they are party to it. So, so striking these trade continuity deals will provide a pathway uh, to accession for the UK. Um, if we just skip to the next slide, this here shows the economic impact of a potential UK-US FTA. Uh, now, both parties have engaged in about five rounds of trade talks so far, um, and fairly good progress has been made. Now, looking at that, you might say, well, the economic gains aren't that large, uh, but the point of modern FTAs is that they're essentially living agreements. So they kind of provide a platform for further liberalization and they build on existing trade complementarities. Uh, now, of course, there will be key sticking points in a UK-US trade negotiation, not least around agricultural standards, uh, but also standards around digital flows. So uh, we know that the US has recently been seeking to completely ban data localization requirements uh, including for financial services and its uh, trade deal with uh, Canada and Mexico uh, and also with Japan that had recently agreed. So there are these key issues, especially if the UK does not want to go down that route, uh, but ultimately striking this deal, given that it is fairly well progressed, uh, could be a quick win uh, for, for both parties. Uh, and just to the next slide, please. But we can't, of course, talk about the US uh, trade relationship without talking about the election that just happened. And we know that there's going to be a change in administration come next year. Uh, and this could impact uh, the US trade policy approach. Now, I do like this quote from uh, Mr. Biden uh, because it kind of sets out what he wants to do with FTAs, which is, it's not that optimistic uh, for someone who's hoping for lots and lots of trade deals to be struck. Uh, but essentially, given the state of the US economy at the moment, he has said uh, that striking new trade deals are likely to take a back seat uh, to prioritizing the domestic economic recovery. Uh, so this could um, stifle progress in UK-US negotiations. Uh, but on the other hand, as I said, it could be a quick win for the administration if they do want to get a deal under their belt. Um, Mr. Biden has also said that the UK, uh, that the US, sorry, um, would look to include tougher uh, environmental and labor provisions in trade deals. And now again, that's something that probably has to be fleshed out with the UK. It could also lengthen out that negotiating process. Um, and another point is that uh, Trade Promotion Authority, which basically in the US, it gives Congress an up-down vote on on trade deals, that's due to expire in the middle of next year. So that means that a UK-US trade deal would need to be presented to Congress by the 1st of April, which doesn't leave much time to kind of iron out all those remaining issues, and in fact, to make those market access offers. I'm just going to the next slide, and the next one, please. 
So just in terms of the macro outlook, well, we kind of faced with this this double whammy of uh, Brexit and COVID here in the UK. And in fact, uh, the survey from the Bank of England, it shows that uh, COVID-related uncertainty is the top source. You know, it far outpaces that of Brexit uncertainty for most businesses at the moment. And uh, what we are seeing with the UK economy, so we recently had the September GDP printout, for example, uh, and UK GDP increased 1.1% month on month in September. Now that was the fifth consecutive month of economic growth, but it was also uh, the third consecutive month that growth slowed. So that recovery is losing some momentum here. And with you know the Brexit deadline looming as well, that could lead to severe disruption for businesses. Just to the next slide. Now, I'd just like to uh, finish up with some insights from our HSBC Navigator survey. So this is our annual survey, surveys over 10,000 businesses, and it's hot off the press because it was just released yesterday. Uh, and these graphics here show uh, what businesses are thinking about in terms of international trade prospects. So business optimism understandably has declined quite considerably this year, uh, but notwithstanding that around 68% of UK businesses are still quite optimistic about trade going ahead. Uh, European partners remain uh, most important to UK businesses uh, looking ahead into the next three to five years. However, they are still looking to expand into Asia and into North America as well. And on the next slide, we have a similar graphic for Indian businesses. Now, Indian businesses much more optimistic than actually a lot of markets that uh, we surveyed. Uh, but however, some of that kind of COVID-19 hit is um, weighing on uh, investment and uh, trade prospects as well. Uh, the Asia Pacific by far remains the most important for Indian businesses considering uh, expanding business. Um, as well as into Europe and North America too. And just my last slide. So in the kind of trade landscape, uh, just to sum up, we have been thinking a lot about the reconfiguration of supply chains that are that is happening at the moment. Uh, but I think the key point here is that supply chains were already moving around, particularly in Asia and even before COVID and before US-China trade tensions as well. Um, however, COVID is likely to accelerate this. Uh, trade deals, they do provide a way for economies to strengthen regional supply chains, particularly in the Asia Pacific, uh, but it also provides market diversification opportunities for businesses outside or in other regions. And so as we look to the future, which is highly uncertain, and we're not exactly sure of what that recovery path might be for economies, uh, trade liberalization opportunities, particularly in the form of trade deals, uh, could provide a good way for businesses to make the most of the situation. So I think I will leave it there and hand it back to Dexa. Janela, thank you so much. That was a really interesting presentation and um, I think leads us in very nicely into our discussions. Um, so with that, I'd like to hand over to UK IBC Director Chris Hayes, who's going to be moderating our Q&A today. Um, so just a reminder for the audience, if you do have any questions, please do drop these into your control panel and Chris will take these up now. Thank you. Many thanks, Doctor. Thank you very much for taking us through that the first part of that webinar. And thank you very much to the speakers for uh, doing such an amazing job in terms of getting what is very, very complicated uh, scenario over to our audience. Uh, just a reminder to the audience, our questions panel is open. So please feel free uh, to put your questions through. We've got 20 minutes. Uh, don't be the person who put your question through at 10.59. It will not get answered. So if you have your questions, please get them through to us. Um, before we begin, and obviously leading on from that question that we've just mentioned about sort of India, what I wanted to do is I wanted to sort of as chair ask the audience another question, which will appear on your screen now. So looking at the sort of UK-India relationship and at the potential for a free trade agreement between the UK and India, uh, does the audience think that this will happen in one to two years' time, two to three, two to three years' time, or more than three years' time? If you could please vote 
Um, and while that vote is taking place, perhaps I could start off by asking uh, Dilip a uh, sort of a question, sort of linked to this. Sort of, there's been a lot of conversations that have been happening uh, recently between the UK and India at the ministerial levels. So, so what are your thoughts in terms of the future trade agreement between the UK and India, Dilip? Sorry, Dilip, I think you're on mute. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, what, what, just asking what, you, what are your thoughts in terms of a future trade agreement between the UK and India? So the way, uh, the way it can go, if, you know, uh, it, um, you, I think uh, if both sides put their mind to it and if we, uh, you know, look at uh, removing out the difficult areas from both sides. We can actually do it in about uh, you know one to two years uh, there. Because if we don't uh, do it, uh, you know, before three years, then we get into election cycle in India, and there'll be there'll be a challenge, uh, you know, when we look at it. So it is possible uh, a partial trade agreement, uh, you know, a PTA, then leading on to a you know, or a comprehensive economic engagement like we done with uh, Japan or Korea or Singapore, it is possible uh, to be uh, done between UK and India. Uh, you know, I, I would just say, uh, you know, because I think, uh, yeah, you know, if you, it depends on how quickly uh, UK uh, can actually uh, move on it, and it should be between. You know, I I, I think between one and two years should be doable. Okay, thanks very much for Dilip for that. And I'll just uh, close that poll over and I'll uh, release the answers uh, shortly. Uh, Richard, just uh, coming to you. Um, obviously at the moment, it's very difficult for businesses. You know, they're trying to work out what they should do, what they shouldn't do. They obviously don't want to be spending vast amounts of money if they if they don't need to. Um, so. Is there like one piece of advice that, that you would give to businesses that they should be doing no, no matter what's happening in the lead up to whether we find out if a deal's done or not? Yeah, well, I think I think the the only sensible planning thing is to assume there is a hard Brexit. There's no free trade agreements. And so if your business um, is cross border into the UK uh, as from the EU or vice versa, uh, you know, you, you have to assume that there's going to be real problems in January. So stockpile, there's not much time left for that, but there's quite a lot of evidence that's already been taking place. Um, but if you also have, you know, um, not really got to grips with Brexit, uh, I think you've got three weeks left. And we have certainly seen some evidence that some people have kind of actually backstopped it. Uh, but now actually the moment is... Uh, very, very little time left to 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 get it done. So, uh, plan for the worst, I think. Okay, no, that, 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 that makes sense. It's good advice. Um, and Chanel, over to you. In terms of uh, the sort of the double whammy of your if you sort of uh, look at it from that point of view of COVID nineteen and Brexit. So, so what's HSBC's view at the moment? Are you seeing sort of a slowdown in investment flows into the UK because of that? Are people holding off decision making or are people actually uh, coming on board because assets now seem to be of, of good value? Yeah, thanks, Chris. So it's a bit of a mixed picture. So I know business investment contracted by about 26% year on year in the second quarter of this year. And that's kind of the view that our um, UK economists take as well in the sense that uh, it will be quite depressed uh, for investment flows. So they are forecasting a contraction of nearly 14% in investment this year and then just a very slight uptick next year. Um, mm. However, the sentiment from customers is a bit more optimistic, I would say. Um, and in fact, also from our navigator survey so over 60 percent of uk businesses are still looking to invest next year despite COVID uncertainty and despite brexit uncertainty uh so very much a mixed picture i would say okay thanks very much for that uh Dilip, just a question coming in to you from the audience uh there's been a lot of talk in the moment about a sort of enhanced trade partnership between the uk and india sort of how do you think that that sort of uh, um, 
will play out given obviously self-reliant India as well. Timothy, any thoughts on that? Uh, the, the the whole thing about self-reliance is actually uh, mis, uh, misunderstood and, and uh, it seems as though it's a protectionist inward looking uh, measure but that's not the real uh, context of that discussion you know i think this actually came out pre-covid because uh, when uh, uh, you know uh, a lot of our suppliers who were based irrespective you know it could have been bosch who's based in wuhan a german company based in wuhan for example or you know the apis which are coming out of different parts of china uh, in end january and early february we found that a lot of our supply chains were getting impacted uh, because mm -hmm. of the sole dependence on one uh, one kind of supply in a particular uh, country so even even before it all came out uh, in February, on, in, in the middle of February, uh, you know, there was a meeting with uh, different industry groups of how do we actually look at alternate sources, how do we actually moving sources uh, within uh, the country, and how do we become, you know, self-reliant uh, by even tapping into global value chains, uh, alternate value chains. So that was the one aspect of self-reliance, and the second one was. Uh, there is a huge uh, uh, consumer demand and, you know, there is a huge uh, requirement of new products and services in India. How do we attract the investment from around the world? So if you look at uh, the recent uh, product linked incentive scheme that was finalized uh, for, let's say, the mobile phones, uh, you know, all three who were actually participating are Samsung, Apple and another, you know, foreign company. So the idea, the idea behind this is, how do we you know, uh, insulate ourselves against uh, such disruptions in the future and how do we become more self-reliant and how do we get, an, you know, uh, get people to also manufacture in India for the Indian market and the world? So that was the concept. So there's no restriction on FTI. There is no, you know, no, 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 nothing else of that sort of being done. It is just really, and it is a word that is understood easily by Indians. So, you know, uh, very difficult to convince an audience overseas. Yeah, indeed. Thanks very much for that, Taylor. Uh, question coming in for you, Chanela, uh, from uh, Jitna. Um, it's currently uh, incredibly expensive to send money from India to the UK, um, as it is from many other countries. Uh, what steps do you see the banking industries taking uh, and sort of international trade and business often um, has unnecessary bureaucracy in there. So are you seeing this from sort of HSBC's point of view? Obviously, a lot of new entrants into the market, which are obviously uh, competing against the, the banks. But from your point of view, is there any sorts of things that, that HSBC are doing in this area? Yeah, thank you for the question. Now, unfortunately, I can't really speak to my own account because I'm on a different side of the bank. Uh, yeah. But what I can say is from a trade uh, perspective, I know those regulatory corporation forums that are included in FTAs, like in the UK, Japan FTA, uh, is hugely helpful in this sense because it kind of provides that platform for uh, economies and parties to just keep on talking about these types of issues and tackling those non-tariff barriers. Um, so unfortunately, I cannot give you specific examples, but I think from the trade side, uh, FTAs are one way to kind of uh, move forward in this respect. Okay, thanks very much for that. i uh, got another question uh, coming from Kevin. Richard, just uh, for you on this one. Um, and maybe Dylan might want to come in on this as well, uh, Michelle, of course, if you wish to as well. Um, the top three asks that you would think the UK government would have of India in terms of any tra free trade deal. Yeah, I'm, I'm, that's probably um, not my immediate area of expertise, but I, I, I think that, um, I mean, the, 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 the key things are, you know, to, to look at, um, you know the, what the flows of trade between the UK and India are, but I would have thought um, probably it would be around tariffs, uh, rules of origin, uh, and custom controls because it mm -hmm. is the sort of the, the most practical physical barriers and costs, is my guess. Okay, thanks very much for that. Uh, we've got a question uh, coming from from Peter. Uh, probably uh, I'll open up to the audience. So I'll I'll try and uh, answer this as well. And um, so he's talking about sort of investment flows from the UK into India. 
and the utilization of the Chinese model. Um, so the Chinese model, obviously, where the architects come with the funding um, and therefore there is a, a prescription to use all of the Chinese services uh, as they build that infrastructure and whether the UK should be looking at that as a model. Uh, so, Peter, from my point of view, uh, there, there is uh, an element of that. So UK export finance uh, do support infrastructure investments in India. Uh, they now are able to do that in, in local currency as well. Um, however, uh, uh, you know, the feeling is from the UK, the fact that we are not prescriptive and that we use the best services rather than um, requiring uh, sort of UK architects, UK project managers, UK construction, UK funding, that whole cocktail opening out uh, to the market seems to be a, a, a better sort of a thought process that, that the UK considers anyway. Dilip Richard, Chanela, anything to add on that one? Uh, on, on, on the trade-related uh, issues, which, which was raised earlier, um, I think if you look at the JETCO meeting, which was held, they looked at three uh, specific areas, including food and drink, right? Yeah. And, uh, okay, and, and uh, data and health services, right? So it is, it is a combination of, you know, migration or, or movement of people uh, demands from both sides because uh, UK may want lawyers and, and education and things. Although the NEP has addressed the education bit to a, uh, to a small extent, uh, but I think uh, these could be the uh, you know areas in that recognized to set up these groups to address them. Uh, on a lighter note, of course, Scotch whiskey will be forever the uh, uh, you know because it, it, it it's a very political uh, issue because uh, you know it's seen as something which is for the affluent, right? And how do you lower duty for the affluent, uh, something which is there, which actually impacts it? So it's a, it's a different political challenge going forward. So that's uh, my take on that uh, going forward. No worries. Thanks very much for that. Um, uh, a question for both Richard and, and Shanella. Uh, we have a, a stock market speculator who's asking, uh, what are your thoughts on the London Stock Exchange, the equity markets in the UK um, over the next decade? Uh, well, presumably that's 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 only one way, isn't it? Only going up. Well, as as a lawyer, of course, um, you don't want to listen to me. But I mean, <laughs> it, the evidence we've seen is that um, there's a lot of people who have looked at the UK market and think it's currently very undervalued. I mean, it's it's mm -hmm. it's taken a big big hit out of COVID. The the GDP forecasts for the UK this year are are dire. Uh, it, there's a, been a big sell-off of the FTSE 250, which is the pure UK exposed index because of Brexit. Um, so if I was an optimist and think that uh, the, the vaccines are going to work and that we're going to get a free trade agreement, I think the FTSE 250 would uh, move forward s significantly. And we're seeing a lot of interest from non-UK buyers, you know, private equity, uh, North American pension funds. I mean, there's a lot of inbound public M&A um, in, in the UK market. And I think that's driven significantly by a value assessment and also an FX assessment. But of course, mm. if I'm wrong about that, uh, the markets could go all the wrong way next year. Thanks very much for that. Uh, Chanel, anything to add? I think I'll just add um, that the biggest upside risk is that a vaccine is rolled out and it's rolled out quite quickly. Uh, mm. But of course, um, we're not, that doesn't guarantee that activity will come back necessarily because the services sector is bearing the brunt of this crisis rather than the manufacturing sector. And I know in trade, for example, we're expecting this two speed recovery in services trade because of the, uh, the lockdown restrictions affecting tourism. Um, uh, but digital services kind of continuing to show strength, particularly in the UK around computer and information services and also financial services as well. Um, so I think even though there is kind of optimism around a vaccine, perhaps some optimism around a trade deal being signed with the EU, uh, that doesn't necessarily guarantee uh, that it will be positive prospects going forward. Yeah, many, many thanks for that. Um, Dilip, question question for you. Um, 
Uh, this is coming from Viranand. Um, given India's recent growing relationship with France, the USA, Australia, um, do you think that the UK is falling down in favour with India or falling down the pecking order? I know that the recent um, investment figures announced from, from India showed that the UK was slightly behind US, Germany, um, Japan. Uh, um, I think the investment figures into uh, UK and falling relatively with the other countries is uh, perhaps uh, probably due to the uncertainty on the Brexit and how it will play out, right? Okay, so once uh, there is clarity on that, and then you know, businesses actually like predictability and certainty. So whether there was a bit of you know lack of predictiveness or lack of uh, this or there's some uncertainty or clouds over the thing, then businesses will take it a bit uh, easy. So I think that's what uh, you are seeing. But again, you know, uh, the max vaccine was just mentioned, and it's a British company, right? Uh, and uh, uh, you are competing with a German American kind of uh, collaboration. But if the AstraZeneca Oxford University and the Serum Institute of India uh, thing takes off and you know the amount of work and effort that has gone in i mean uh, it could be just dramatically positioning the trade between the two countries and the relationship between the two countries uh, very very differently so i you know i believe that yeah. uh, whatever blip you've seen or whatever dip you've seen now is temporary and uh, we will see it uh, going forward Thanks very much. Um, final question, obviously conscious of time. Questions coming from Mark. Uh, I'll put this one to you, Chanel, but other panelists can come in. Um, do you see more scope for UK exports of technology and digital services um, as we leave the EU? Um, and obviously of Indian investments into the UK? Yeah, thank you for the question. Um, in general, yes to uh, increase in digital services exports. I mean, the UK has a competitive advantage in it. It's well positioned to take uh, to make the most of that opportunity going forward. Uh, but in order to do so, I think the right kind of frameworks have to be in place because it's not as simple as just exporting a digital service abroad, uh, particularly if you do have these competing kind of uh, frameworks for uh, regulating digital trade in different jurisdictions uh, and a challenge for the UK will be to kind of square that so it still needs to decide on what its digital framework will be uh, whether it remains aligned to the EU model of kind of valuing privacy over the kind of free flow of cross-border data uh, which is mainly supported by the likes of the US and also some Asia Pacific economies as well um, so I think in terms of trade uh, those kind of frameworks need to be in place in order for uk businesses to make the most of it but having said that as i mentioned before uk digital services exports are holding up better than more traditional services flows like tourism and transportation uh, now we are yet to see what that will be like in q3 and q4 uh, but it certainly bodes well for uk exporters of those types of services Thanks, Vanilla. Uh, and apologies to everybody if we didn't manage to get your question um, answered uh, within this session, but I think it's been an absolutely fantastic hour. A uh, huge thanks to Shanella, Richard and Dylan. Uh, just before we leave, I'll share with you the results. So as you can see, the vast majority of people think that it will be more than three years or at least more than two years um, before a free trade deal is done. Hopefully we'll see some announcements coming up um, in the next um, sort of couple of weeks about that roadmap. Uh, so a huge thank you to everybody for uh, taking part and for interacting with us at this UK IBC webinar in association with Ficky. Huge thanks to HSBC and to Alan Overy for providing their experts as always. Um, if you want more information about our webinars, please be, feel free, follow us on Twitter, at UKIBC. Uh, we're on LinkedIn. We have a fantastic LinkedIn group, 15,000 people interested in the UK and India. Follow us there. And if you want to sign up for our free monthly newsletter, you can do so on our webinar. Sorry, Dilip, did you want to say something? Oh. Perfect. So a huge thank you to everybody. Please all stay safe while the vaccines are currently getting flown all over the world. 
and hopefully who knows sometime in 2021 we can do this with an actual stage an actual audience but until then we'll continue to run these webinar sessions so that everybody can interact thank you very much for your time thanks everybody